with you this morning. Amen. A lot of people have it on their phones. I have people tell me I wasn't on my phone. I was on my Bible app. So <laughs> however you have it, let's open our word this morning. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm usually, I, when I prepare my message, I just, I'm all over the place in the word. I'm just tracing the word of God. And so we're going to begin this morning though in Acts chapter 2. And uh, this is a quote from um, the prophet Joel. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. But let's pray, if we could, before we go to the Word this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we just are just so thankful to be in your house today, Lord, to be able to sense the love of God, Lord, to be able to sense your presence. And, Lord, I thank you again for what you're doing in the earth, Lord, for what you're doing again in your church, Jesus for what you're doing in the in the United States of America. Oh, God. Lord, I thank you for what you're stirring, Lord Jesus, for the revival that's beginning again in our souls, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, today I pray that as we open your word, Lord, I, I, I pray that your word, oh God, would be heard, your voice, oh Lord, would be heard, and that you, oh Lord, would minister to our hearts and would begin to stir something so deep, oh God, as deep cries out to deep, Lord. Father, that you would speak to us very clearly now, Lord. Hallelujah. Have your way in our hearts today, Jesus. In our hearts, first of all, Lord. Have your way. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, Acts chapter 2, verses... 17 and 18 it says this and it shall come a pass in the it come to pass in the last days says God that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams and on my men servants and my maid servants that's male and female I will pour out my spirit In those days, and they shall prophesy. To prophesy means to divinely speak under the inspiration of the Lord. You know, we are in the last days. I believe we're in the latter part of the last days. The last days in the Old Testament was described as a time that was forthcoming. They weren't in the last days in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they were prophesying of a day to come where God would pour out His Spirit, where there would be mighty moves and powerful moves of God. It's also marked by the judgment of evil and God bringing salvation to people. You see this in the Old Testament. Last days, as described in the New Testament, was when Jesus came to the earth the first time. And then we had the great outpouring of the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came for the first time to dwell in, in, in mankind. That we became that vessel, truly the temple of the Holy Spirit. The last days began when Jesus first came to the earth. The last days will not end until he comes back again for his church. So we are in the last days. They've been in the last days for a long time. So when you hear people say, we're in the last days, we've been in the last days. But I believe with all my heart, we're in the latter part of the last days if you, if you study scripture and if you pay attention to what is going on in the world. I mean, the Lord says that we need to be, don't just be, well, I'm going to get off, off topic. Don't just be mindful. Like, we can be mindful of the seasons. We can be mindful. We know that when things, well, we used to, you could be mindful of the seasons. Now things are a little crazy with the weather. But you're mindful of the things that you can see with your natural uh, um, um, senses. He also tells us we need to be mindful of the things of the Spirit. And we need to read the Word, we need to study the Word, and we need to see the things that are happening around us and have our eyes opened to to what's going on in the world. The latter days, 
Um, the last days are to be marked by the judgment of God against evil and sin and powerful moves of God on the earth. It also should be marked by bold evangelism. That's what Joel means in Joel 2 and in Acts 2 when it says the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. There's an ushering in of the presence of God in these last days. And this ushering in of his presence, his presence causes people to turn away from their rebellion, to turn away from compromise, to turn away from pride and selfishness, and to truly, wholly surrender to God. Like to really put their faith in God. Not just go to church on Sunday mornings. Not just have a head knowledge of who he is. But as the presence of God is ushered in, when the Spirit of God is poured out, that is when hearts are changed, eyes are opened by the power of the Holy Spirit, then where the love of God is truly recognized. Not just known, but recognized in our hearts. And in Joel 2 and in Acts 2, these last days, where God said, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. This word all, when you study this word, it is each and every part of mankind. It's a part of a whole. It's all means each piece of a whole. It doesn't mean at one time God's going to send a a revival all over the earth. No, it means I'm going to pour out my spirit and I'm going to do a little here and I'm going to do a little here. I'm going to do it piece by piece. It's part of the whole, all flesh. It can be nation by nation, generation by generation, state by state, city by city, church by church, school by school. It's him pouring out his spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters, your male and your female servants. I'm telling you, the Lord is bringing revival again to our nation. And we can see in scripture that some will get it and some will miss it. And I, with all of my heart, I want all of us to get it, to be a part of what the Lord is doing in our nation, in this younger generation, revival in the Word of God. The word revival is not a biblical word, but neither is the word rapture. The word revival is not in Scripture. The word revived is in Scripture. The word revival is like CPR to your soul. This is how you can know it's revival. It's Christ providing rejuvenation or refreshment or renewal. This week I had a a conversation with someone on the phone, and they even said, I don't know if this is the right word to use, but when I left church last week, I felt rejuvenated. If you were here last week, you felt rejuvenated, I hope, from the presence of God. That is a taste of revival. We have to be careful that we're not putting God in a box and then we're not saying, well, it wasn't revival because it stopped and everybody went home. Or because, hey, you know, we didn't have revi- we didn't have church at night. We didn't have, it, it, we can't put God in a box and say, well, God, that doesn't look like any revival I've ever seen. I believe we had a taste of revival last Sunday in church. I believe it's the Lord's desire to bring revival to this church for this community's sake. And it starts with us individually. It starts with each one in our hearts. Do we desire Revival, because it is in the air. Revival can be an individual revival, an individual refreshment and renewal, or it can be a public, a a corporate revival. But I believe it starts, it may start with two people who say, hey, I'm hungry for a move of God. I'm hungry for more of him. And I want us to, 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 there's, there's so much talk and conversation right now about revival, revival, revival on all these college campuses. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. But the truth is, it it doesn't need to just stay with that generation. And the Lord is showing us that there's something he is trying to do. And, oh, God help us not to miss it. Not to miss out on what he's doing. I put this in my notes. We don't need to westernize the move of God. The Western countries, the Western, the United States. You know, God is not American. (laughs) We don't need to put him in a box. And if it doesn't look like this, then it's not God. 
If it doesn't look like this, then it's not, it's, it's not of him. It's not revival. We've got to be very careful if we do this and we have him in a box and we think we've got it figured out. We will not have a revival in our soul. We will limit the movement of God on the earth. Every revival has critics. Every revival has spectators. And every revival has, has, has people that even mock. Even on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were one to the Lord in one day in one city. And yet many mocked and missed what was happening right before their eyes. Oh God, help us. Help us to have the discernment of the Lord to do everything decently and in order according to the word of God, but not to miss him. Not to miss him. Oh, he desires to pour his heart afresh and anew over us. Last week, when we were in the service, the Holy Spirit was so prevalent and and almost tangible in this place. If you missed it, the Lord himself, through, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, message in tongues and interpretation, in one of those, the Lord said, I'm doing a new thing. But we need to understand what that means when the Scripture says, I'm doing, or when the Lord says, I'm doing a new thing. The Scripture in Isaiah 43, it's, it's, it's the same words that the Lord spoke to us so powerfully last week as the same words that he spoke to his children in that day. Isaiah 43, it describes a time in history where God's people, they had been overcome, overpowered by their enemy. They had been held in bondage. They had truly been defeated as the people of God. Yet God desired to rescue them. But at the time that this word came forth, they had not surrendered to the Lord at this point. They were still in bondage. In Isaiah 43, God came and he reminded them of a few things. He reminded them of all that he had already done for them. He reminded them of of what he had done against the enemy for their sake. He reminded them that he was God, that he was the way maker. He reminded them that he made a way through the mighty seas and the mighty waters. And he reminded them, he said, I've already called out and extinguished the enemy. He reminded them of that. And then on, in Isaiah verses um, 18 and 19 in chapter 43, it says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God was telling his people then, He said, we have to stop looking back. The enemy has been defeated, and now I'm going to do a new thing. Like he was making available a fresh, new, uh, now time for forgiveness, blessing, restoration for his presence. But then he asked the question, will you not perceive it? Like, Will you not see it? Will you not receive it? What he was saying is, will you? Will you or will you not? If we open our hearts to believe him, then we are not going to miss what it is that he is doing. We will not miss him. The Lord here, he was prophesying of the day of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what the new thing was. There's nothing new under the sun, the word says. Yet this new thing was the fact that God was no longer going to have to speak through just prophets He was going to be able to commune with his people because Jesus was coming and he was going to give his life for the sake of mankind so that we could then have the powerful Holy Spirit to live with us. When Jesus, when the the Lord uses these words, behold, we know behold means to see, like to perceive, not with your eyes, with your heart. God's saying, behold, perceive. But this is what the word means in the Hebrew. To to behold, to perceive what I am bringing or what I am about to bring. In this passage specifically, the word behold means, will you see and perceive what I'm about to bring with a change of person? It really means a change of person. He was prophesying about Jesus. Jesus there, we can see that Jesus was this new thing. 
that the Holy Spirit was the, was the new thing he was talking about. So when the, when, when the word came last week, behold, I'm doing something new. What Jesus is saying is perceive with your heart. The Holy Spirit is being moved again, is being poured out again. Like, will we perceive it or will we not? That's what the Lord was bringing in Isaiah 43, he said, I desire, if you read this whole passage of Scripture, the whole chapter, he said, I desire to give you water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He said, I desire to give drink to my chosen people. He was saying, I desire to give you refreshment. Like God's heart is to refresh us. God's heart is to nourish us. It is to renew us. He said in verse 20 of Isaiah 43, I will give you drink to my chosen people that I formed for myself that they might declare my praise. He's saying they'll declare, that we will declare the praises of God. What he's saying is when we're dried up spiritually and we don't have any praise on our lips, that our lives are not doing what we need to do for the sake of the kingdom of God on the earth. And after the last few years, there's no judgment here. But we have all gotten to a place where we've been a little dry. There's been hard times over the last few years. You had a year of COVID and craziness. Then you had another year of confusion and fear. And then you had civil unrest. And then you had racial tension. And then you've had all of these things. All of these things. And people are tired. And people are worn out. And it's just amazing to me. That our God, who loves us with a never-ending love, that he comes when he knows that we need him the most. Not the answers, but we need him the most. And he brings these, these, these streams in the desert and these rivers of living water over our soul. When we need it, behold, I am doing something new. Behold, I'm going to pour out my spirit afresh and anew. A fresh outpouring. It springs forth. Will you or will you not see it? Will you or will you not open your hearts to receive it? That is what the scripture says. That is what the Lord has been saying to us. Revival means gaining a renewed zeal to follow God. And to be obedient to God. Revival is not just an experience where we get refreshed. Revival is a renewal so that we, we, we follow more closely after him. We desire more of him. And, and, and we follow him more closely so that our heart, so that he gets more glory. Revival's not just for our sake. Revival is to nourish us for the lost sake. So that, so that God gets glorified. Revival, it resuscitates our spirit and it brings us back to life. Charles Spurgeon, he said this. Revival is to live again, to receive again life which was almost expired, to rekindle into flame the vital spark which was nearly extinguished. Our nation needs revival. The church in our nation needs revival. I read something this week. The, the United States is in a, in a spiritual, which you can see this, is in a spiritual downward spiral. And we were always the nation to send missionaries to other countries. And now we're in a place of desperation because we're needing missionaries to come to our own country. That is the truth. That is the truth. There's people that are just dying, and they're just, they're just, they're just dying from a lack of spiritual uh, uh, influence and, and nourishment. Psalm 85, 6. This was written as a, as a prayer for revival. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? That's what I've been praying for two years. Oh, God, revive us again, Lord. Revive us again, oh, God. Not so that we can go back to what we were before COVID hit. Because we had a great momentum going before COVID hit. But not to revive us so that we could go back there. But revive us so that we can go forward with you. For whatever it is that you're doing so that we don't miss it. So that we don't put you in a box. And then miss what it is that you're doing on the earth. 
God help us. Every revival is meant to bring life, refreshment, and renewal to God's people. But it's also meant to bring praise and glory to God. It's a move of God that we see happening right now in these, in these young people, in these teenagers, in these young adults all over the United States. And my prayer is, God, that it not stop there, but it truly spill over into the church of Jesus Christ. That it spill over into the church. This revival that we see is the Holy Spirit is breaking through lukewarm hearts and it's bringing a cleansing to the body of Christ so that that, that the Lord can be glorified in the earth again or in our nation again. Truly, the revival is so the church can get cleansed. I believe this. I believe with all my heart. There's, there's, so many, there's so many skeptics. There's so many naysayers that this is not revival. This is not revival. This is not revival. Call it what you want to. It is a move of God. And we can perceive it and see it and believe it and hope for it. Or we cannot. This is what I find interesting. When COVID-19 hit, I was, I was looking at this this week. When COVID-19 hit, the generation that was most affected, most affected, not just by the sickness when the sickness came, but long-term effects, was the same generation that now the Spirit of God is pouring out over. The same generation. Like these, it's it's the 16 to 25-year-olds, the ones with problems with with isolation and, and... depression the spirit of suicide it's it's horrible we hear that so many times in in people over the age of 50 and 60 especially but not this time it is this younger generation and now god has chosen he said i'll pour out my spirit on all flesh i will pour it out a section at a time a piece at a time he said i will pour it out that means to bestow that means i'm going to give it like a gift Some will receive it, and some will not. Will we receive what it is that he desires to do? If we want revival in our hearts, in our families, in our church, in our our community, there are some conditions as you study the Word of God. Every place that he came to revive his children, there are some conditions that you see. I don't know about you, but I want revival in my heart. I want revival, a newness a freshness in, in, in everything, in my family, in our church, in this community. The first condition of revival is humility. Second Chronicles 7.14 is a very familiar passage of Scripture. If my people who were called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face... And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And I will heal their land. Notice Jesus, the Lord didn't say, Well, revival's going to come when all the sinners become to come into your church and get saved. He said, Revival's going to come when my people, who were called by my name, will humble themselves again before the Lord, to humble, to bring low, to wholly surrender, to bend your knee to the Lord, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That is where revival begins. First with humility. If you were here last week, one of the words that the Lord gave, it started this way. My people, humble yourselves before me. That was God. Speaking to us, the privilege that we have, that the Lord speaks to us so personally. He is inviting us into what he's desiring to do. Will we perceive it? Will we receive it in our hearts? Humble yourselves before the Lord. Hallelujah. If my people, he says... Call by my name, will bow their hearts to me, will submit to me, will make me Lord, truly Lord. Like I have got to be the priority of your life. 
not relationships, not your education, not your career, not money. But I've got to be the priority again. He said, if you will humble, humble yourself before me. He said, then if you will pray, if you will seek my face, if you will turn away from your sins. He says, I will hear your cry. And then those burdens, those, the, the bondages to sin, all of those things. He promises to hear the cry and to respond to his people. He promises to bring forgiveness and healing and restoration. But it all begins with us humbling ourselves before him and truly making him Lord again. This needs to be our prayer. God, anything that is not of you, that is in my heart, that is in my life, reveal it to me, O oh God. That has got to be our prayer. Revival begins when he becomes Lord again and we humble ourselves before him. Revival begins with humility. Bringing our hearts in subjection under him so that he is in control of our lives. The second thing it says is pray. Seek my face. He's talking here prayer and confession. It's the second condition to revival. James 5.16 says this, Therefore confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. God desires that we make the choice to separate ourselves from sin. Like all sin, that we make the choice to humbly come before him, to seek his face in his presence, and to, 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 so that he can show us the error of our ways. There's so many times that we have things in our life, we have, we have issues in our life, that if we would let God put his finger on it, that he would really deal with some things in our life, in our heart. And then revival would come if we would, if we would pray, seek his presence, seek his face, and then confess the things that he brings to our hearts. He says this, he says, confess your sins one to another. He's not talking about go tell everybody what you've done wrong. He's not saying, just go tell everybody all your sins. If you think about this, first you humble yourself. Then you seek his face. And you confess the things to him that are not right. In James, he says this, then you, then you confess your sins to one another. He's talking about as God reveals things to your heart that should not be there, if we are the peacemakers and the children of God, then it is our responsibility to go and try to make peace. If they don't respond, they don't respond. But our responsibility is to make peace. If we want revival in our hearts, we have to do what the Word of God says to do. We have to seek his presence in our life. We have to pray and ask him, search me, O oh God, see if there's any wicked way in me. And if he reveals those things, maybe, that, maybe, maybe we know that, that someone, I'll say this, 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 this week I was, I was praying over this message and I just kept having a family come to my heart. And I'm like, Lord, have I done something? Have I done something to hurt them? Have I done something to offend them? Is this me? Is this the devil? Is this you? I mean, I had to sit there and pray for a few minutes about it. Because, you know, the devil can, can put Scripture in your mind and make you feel guilty. God doesn't make you feel ashamed. God makes you want to do something right. He draws you to righteousness. And I'm saying, oh, God, I've been praying for revival. I want revival in my heart. I want revival in every part of my life. So just in case, just in case I may have caused an offense, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out and just make sure. That's what the Lord's talk, what James is talking about when he says, confess your sins one to another. Go, try to make it. If you've done something, have I offended you? Have I hurt you? If someone has hurt you or offended you, do what the Bible says to do. Don't go tell them everything they did wrong. Go and say, I want, to make my, I want my heart to be pure. I want our relationship to be unified as unto the Lord. Do what the Word of God says to do. Because if we want revival, we can't walk around holding grudges. We can't walk around with unforgiveness. We can't walk around with hurt and pain. 
Because by, the Lord has given us, through his word, he's given us steps to take in order to find refreshment and renewal. He said, stop looking at the past. Don't consider the old things. We need to forget the old pain. We need to forget the old. We need to stop looking at those things. And we need to set our eyes on things above. We need to set our heart on the Lord and go forward with him. This prayer and confession, when it says confess your sins one to another, he literally is talking about because you've spent time with me. And I've shown you things that, need to, that you need to change so your heart can be free. Then you go. I want to be free. And I don't want to be a stumbling block. You don't, want to, you don't want someone to be offended with your life. Because then they're not free. And we're supposed to love one another as unto the Lord. If we want revival, we've got to do what the Word of God says. We humble ourselves before the Lord. We seek His face as He shows us things. We are His children. We don't hold an offense, but we don't give off an offense. And if we've done one or the other, we need to get on our face before God and let Him give us the wisdom to know what to do. Then revival will come. It consists of humility. It consists of praying. It consists of seeking His presence, His face. Not what He can do. Revival's not just about, I'm going to spend a lot of time praying for direction. Revival is, God, I'm just going to spend time in your presence. What do I want most? I want most, I want more of your presence. More of you and more of your spirit. More of your life. That's what he wants in our lives. It consists of humility, prayer, seeking his presence, not hiding in our sin. But as he deals with our hearts, we go in love to others, and we, we, we try to bring healing. We read all this. We studied all this with the Beatitudes. This is, again, where God is just showing us in his word. If we want revival, we cannot hold on to bitterness. We cannot hold on to unforgiveness. We cannot. We have got to do what God's word says to do. We will not find true revival, lasting revival. Hear me. You can feel like you've had a revival. You can feel like you've had refreshment. You can have an encounter with the Holy Spirit that rejuvenates you. And those are wonderful things. But if you want something that eternally changes your heart, that that lasts for a lifetime, and our lifetime is eternity with Jesus, then we have to let him have access to all that we are. We have to humble ourselves and be hungry for his presence. And then allow him to free us from everything that he considers sin. That violates him or his way. Hallelujah. See, when we think of sin, so many times we think of big obvious sins. But he was talking to his people who, yes, they weren't surrendered to him at the time, so there was probably some very big, obvious cultural sins in their heart. But what about in the church? I'm not talking about our church, y'all. I think we've been so very blessed with a wonderful church, with peace. But just the church of Jesus Christ. Like, like what about in the church? Unforgiveness. It's a sin. Living in bitterness, it's a sin. Gossip, it's a sin. When we cast judgment on somebody because they don't look like we think they're supposed to look, it's a sin. And God's like, I want to start revival. You you may have mixed emotions about this movie, Jesus Revolution, because the truth is, in the 70s, Jesus Revolution got a little wonky. But what, what revival hasn't gotten wonky when, when people get involved and flesh gets involved? But when it's God, it's not like that. And I'm just going to get off this for just a minute. We went to see it. I've seen it twice. We saw it and we took some people to see it. The heart of it is this. The church has gotten jaded and can't see people the way they're supposed to see them. And the generation that is most misunderstood and that has, has 
has been attacked the most by, by the enemy is the one that God is moving the most in right now. They're hungry. They're hungry for change. There's a comment in that movie. And he said they're searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. It just grips my heart. Because I know kids that grew up, even some in our youth group, they were so in love with the Lord at one time. I know that it was not just an emotional experience. They loved God. But they've gone away. They've gone away from the Lord. And they're searching and they're filling their hearts with things. We have some people in our lives that are very worldly people. And I pray, God, if if we invite them to come in, that they will be loved like Jesus would love them. Because that's when they'll get saved and when we will get revived. Truly revived. Like a lasting revival in our hearts. Humility. Prayer and confessing our sins. And the last thing that you will find in revival is this. Repentance. Turning away from sin. A complete surrender to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow or godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The the, The foundation of the Lord is built on these two truths. He says that the Lord knows those who were His. And let everyone who, who names the name of the Lord. Remember, you can't say the name of the Lord. Truly, the Lord, he's your Lord unless you've accepted him in your heart. That whoever names the name of the Lord departs from iniquity. These two truths, like, like, like your foundation, your, your faith, your heart. Is, if it, it needs, these things have to be set in stone. You have to know You have to know that the Lord knows you. He knows everything about you if you belong to him. And we have to know that if we bear his name, we cannot live close to sin. We cannot. We depart from iniquity. Depart means to withdraw, to abstain from. Iniquity is just unrighteousness. Anything that violates God. Those things we named earlier that violate the Lord. Revival. As we get closer to the Lord, as we desire more of His Spirit in our lives, it produces a godly sorrow. So we're truly sorry for our sin. Like we're sorry for the things that He's revealed. That, that, that he, He's not judging us. He's not casting guilt or shame. He's just saying, I want to free you from these things so that, so that I can use your life so that I'll receive the glory and more people will come to know the Lord. The more that we... Repent, this condition of revival, more that we repent, the more that we turn away from our sins, and the more that we surrender to the Lord, the more revival comes. The more nourishment comes, the more refreshment comes. So many times we we get so burdened down with life, and we we just need, hear me, revival doesn't have to be, hey, we're going to have revival for the next five nights at church. Maybe it's revival. Maybe it's just some really good worship services. Revival will bring nourishment, refreshment, renewal. God will get the glory. And people will be changed. They'll be drawn to the Lord. Hallelujah. Many times in the Word, you'll see that revival comes after a time of testing. The last two and three years in our nation have been a time of testing. Very difficult times for so many. Romans 12 says, 
is our spiritual act of worship when we live sacrificially before the Lord. Right? We, we present our lives, our bodies as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable to God. The only way to remain holy and acceptable to God is to try to live in a place of being revived by His presence. Revived by His presence. Revival's not just a, a, a one-time thing. Revival's coming now in our nation because our nation has gotten so, so jaded and so far away from the Lord. So that those that are hungry, those that desire it, it will come. I believe with all my heart the Lord desires to continually, piece at a piece, place at a place, pour out his revival. His nourishment, his refreshment. Romans 12, do not be conformed to the world, the world's ways. He says, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The renewal of your mind through testing so that you can discern the Lord's will. And that that, that this will produce what you know in God's good and perfect will for your life. That renewal, what we need is the revival of our minds. We truly need the revival of our minds. Matthew, if you guys will go ahead and come on, please. I want us to have some time for prayer here at the end. Oh, God, help us. Revival. It consists of humility, prayer and confession, repentance and turning away from sin, a complete surrender of our heart, making him Lord again. He's the priority. Revival means to be renewed, refreshed, rejuvenated spiritually. It means to gain a renewed zeal. A new zeal and excitement and energy to follow God and to obey God. I don't know about you, but I don't know many people right now that don't need revival. Hello? Do we need revival? I mean, I'm telling you. This is my prayer, and I hope this will be your prayer too. Psalm 85, 6, I read it just a few minutes ago. Will you revive us again, O God, that we may rejoice in you? This is the way I pray this. Will you revive me again, O God, so that I can praise you with my life? When, we, when, we, when he revives us, that's when we get those rivers of living water again. Those rivers of living water. When, when the Lord spoke this through the prophet Isaiah, His children were in a place of defeat and had been overcome. Still in bondage. But he spoke it and said it's going to be available. We have that availability now. We're living in that time. Jesus has come. The Holy Spirit is available. I remember going to a women's conference years ago. And I was just in a, I was just in a, oh, I was in a dry place. You know, a lot of little kids at the house. I was just in a dry season. And I remember going to the front when they, when they had the altar call. Like, you just want more of Jesus. Do you just want, do you just want more of Jesus? Yeah, you know, I didn't know of anything that was a sin or anything in my life. I just knew I needed something. And I remember the guest speaker came down off the platform. Her name Karen Wheaton. Many of you may know her. She came down off the platform and she stood right in my face. And she put her hand on my head. And she started praying. And she looked at me and she said, those rivers of living water are going to flow. I mean, they're going to flow in your life. At the time, I did not feel that at all. Like I was, I was, I was just, man, I wasn't in sin. I, just, I was just dry. But when she spoke it, I know that it was the Lord because she came off the platform, wove her way through those people and came straight to me, prayed over me, and she said, the rivers of living water will flow again in your life. But I still had a choice. I still had, I could believe it. I could receive it. I could desire it. And I could say, God, it doesn't matter how I feel. You have said I, do, I believe with all my heart that was the beginning of the breaking of some, some, some things off of my life. I don't believe I would be the person that I am today 
if I had not have said, God, I don't feel it, but I believe it because you have said it. I don't have to understand it. I just believe it because you have said it. Sometimes we want to feel something to think there's a revival. Revival in our faith is not about what we feel. It's about what we believe and know to be true. He says, I desire to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, who will receive it? Will you perceive it? It now springs forth. He's always trying to spring forth life. Will we perceive it? Will we receive it? Will we have our hearts open to receive it? Oh, God, help us. I'm going to ask them just to play something. We're going, to, we're going to spend some time in prayer today. These are my questions. Do you need refreshment? Do you need a new, a new renewed strength in your life? Do you need restoration somehow in your heart or in, in just in your life somewhere? Do you need a renewed joy? Revival brings a renewed joy. If you need those things, you need revival. Do you need resurrection to some dead places in your life? Maybe in some, re- in some relationships. Maybe in your marriage. Maybe just in your soul. Maybe you're like I was when I went to the women's conference. God, I'm just, I'm just, I don't even know. I'm just numb. I'm numb and I'm dry and I need you again. Oh God, do you need that? Then you need revival. Maybe you're here and you've never fully given your life to the Lord. You need to surrender your heart to Him today. Oh, He loves you with an everlasting love. And He desires to pour life into you. Scripture says if you believe on Him that He died on the cross and that He rose from the grave, that He did that as a substitute for our sin. And that when He rose again, He defeated the devil. He has been defeated And that if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord, that we've given Him control of our life, then we are saved. Then we we belong to Him. So if you need Jesus here, you need salvation, which brings revival into your life. Before we leave, um, we're going to pray over our young people. read a few things to you. This Gen Z, Generation Z, as they're called, the generation right after the millennials, this, uh, which, which I know the ages and the years can get a little skewed, but this is the largest generation in our nation's history. They currently make up about 27, 28% of our nation's population. If you're born between the ages of 1997 and around 2012, there's recorded 72 to 73 million of that age in our nation currently. They're labeled tech addicts and antisocial. mental health challenges of anybody their age before. They're called the loneliest generation. Some of this is because of the hours that they spend online or on smartphones instead of cultivating real relationships. Their mental health was greatly challenged from 20 to 22. They carried great stress from COVID and then also just isolation, a lack of education. Many of them had to teach themselves online, and especially those that were in upper high school when that hit. It was difficult. They were isolated at home. There was civil unrest all in our nation. 
confusion beyond what they could really understand. Racial tension beyond what they could understand. It was division and stress really on every, every avenue of their life. Yet this is the age group that the enemy has tried so hard to destroy where God is beginning a revival. And we have some of those people in that age group here today, and and, and I want us to pray for them. But this is what I feel in my heart to do. If you have a child or, well, they're still a child if they're 25. If you have someone that is around that age, that's a prodigal that is not serving the Lord, I want to ask you if we can pray with you for them as well. You come with me. So if you're between the ages of, let's see, whatever that would be, if you were born between 1995 to 97 up to 2012 to 2013 or 14, I'm going to ask if you would please come forward this morning or if you have a prodigal child or grandchild that's that age. I want us to pray. you to look at the number of people that either fall in that age group or they have children or grandchildren that are in that age group. The enemy is trying so hard to confuse and destroy, but God (laughs) is pouring out, whether you realize it or not, whether whether you perceive it or not, I know that in my heart because it fits the conditions of revival. There's humility that's coming over these campuses. There's repentance that's coming. There's salvation that is there. It's not about, uh, sometimes as a Pentecostal church, we want revival to be when people are loud and people are are expressive. And some of us, I, I I love to worship, and I know I can get loud in worship. That's just who I am. But it's not about it, it, it's it's not about our personalities. It's about the Lord and what He's doing. And this is what I want us to do. I want us to believe today. Can y'all can y'all step up this way so we can try to get everybody close? Step up as close as you can. Um, I want us to if you are if you are those students, can you get on this front row right here? Let's do this. If you're a student between. Those, in those ages I gave, can you step up where you're on this front row right here? Step up here. So y'all, can you let, let Miss Abby in right there? Okay. Okay, and then the others, if y'all come forward, I want us to be able to... Hallelujah. And I want to ask you students first, if, if you're here, can you really want revival in your heart? You don't have to raise your hand. But all you have to do is ask him. But you also have to pursue him. And you have to humble yourself before the Lord. You have to make him truly the Lord of your life. Okay, he, he doesn't hide himself from us. He truly, he, he desires to fill your life with these streams in the desert and the dry places and rivers of living water. He wants to nourish your spirit. He never wants you to get to a place where you go, I'm just dry. Where are you, God? He never wants you to get to that place. As you stay close to him, that, that the, his Holy Spirit in your life is like those rivers of living water. His Holy Spirit in your life is like, is like the oil of joy. It's like the oil of heaven. In the Old Testament, they would pour oil over over the priests and they would anoint them to do the work of God. When you receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it's like you've now you have, if you're living for Him and you really have the Holy Spirit active in your life, it's like you are anointed now to live for Him, to be His child. It's not about what you feel. It is truly about what you believe in your heart and then the way that you live that. Because as you begin to believe what he says about you and who you are in Christ, and you believe to walk it out and live it, people are going to see a difference. 
On the flip side of that, the devil doesn't want you to do that. So he's going to fight. That's why he's, he, he has fought your generation so badly. Because if there's more of you than anybody else right now in our nation, if your generation gets a hold of God and gets full of the Holy Spirit, it will change this whole nation. It will change the whole nation. I believe it. It's not just from the adults down. It's a matter of who gets a hold of the Word and who follows the anointing of the Lord. Most of the people in the Word of God that were used were people your age. Why? Because they believed in God and they believed what He said and they weren't skeptics and they weren't mockers. They just said, God, I've experienced something real and now I want to go with you. So that's what I'm asking you to do. If you, if you trust Him, if you love Him, if you want to go with Him, just tell Him, God, I want more of you in my life. That's what I want. Just, just pray that over yourself. I'm going to ask Pat to pray. And then if you're in here and you have prodigals, we're praying the same thing. This is what I want us to pray, that every lie that they believe will, just, will lose its power over their mind. Every lie, every lie that they believe that would, would, would lose its power And I want us to pray that every hurt in their heart, every place there is a wound in their heart, that it will be healed in the name of Jesus. That the Holy Spirit would come, that He will speak to them in their dreams at night, that they will see who they are, who they were created to be. I was one of those prodigals one time, and my parents prayed me in. You keep praying. It will make a difference. Lord, we thank you for this precious group, God. That you ordained and designed to be alive and to be with you and a part of your kingdom for such a time as this. And I thank you for what you're doing, God, in their generation. I thank you for what you have spoken over them. I thank you for destiny, God, for the legacy that they'll leave. I thank you, God, that regardless of what the enemy or others have spoken in their ears, God, your truth about who they are, God, their identity in you, the value that you place on them, how precious they are to you, God, nothing can take that truth away. Lord, our lives respond to what takes place around us, and you just resonated in my head. When Kim asked me to pray, what shall we say to these things? Let the response of this generation to life, let them say to these things that are trying to speak contrary to them, if God is for me, who can stand against me? Holy Spirit, as only you can, as the words have been spoken, God, as hearts have been yielded, God, as humility is is shown, God, in this place. And as parents are standing in proxy for lost loved ones and grandparents are standing in proxy for them, Lord, you are with them as surely as you're with these precious young ones here. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we we call out, Holy Spirit, move and blow and flow as only you can. In quietness, but in power. Let the words of life begin to flow and move and be stirred up in the hearts and the minds, God, of these young people, God, and in these prodigals. They've heard your word, Lord. Your proclamation is that we'll do what you have proclaimed and called it to do, Lord. I pray that you would resonate and blow, Lord, on the embers of the fire of the word of God, Lord, in these young people, God, and that true revival come. Repentant hearts and hearts that have a yes for you. Thank you for meeting them here now, God. For those that are away, God, thank you for sending laborers that they will listen to. Thank you for sending spirit-filled young men and women and old men and women, God, that have the power and the love of God in them to these lost and, and prodigal children, God, where they are. Thank you for willing saints of God that you will put, Lord, these kids on their hearts, God, and they will pursue them in your name.
thank you for the shift today, God, and for what you're bringing about. We love you and we thank you, God. We bless you.